what we can hope for is obviously that that excess stays uh, and it's due to new physics so i think that everyone even people <laughs> who said oh it must be an air leak uh, or yeah. it must be some mismodeling of your background or yeah. I mean, everyone in the physics community is hoping to see something uh, beyond the standard model of physics, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Today, we're going to be discussing a potential dark matter signal discovered by the Xenon collaboration using the most sensitive dark matter detector in the world, Xenon 1 ton at the IFNF laboratory in Gran Sasso in Italy. And joining us to discuss this fascinating possibility is Dr. Laura Menenti of the New York University Abu Dhabi and a member of the collaboration. So Dr. Menenti, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. We very much, uh, very much appreciate it. So maybe if we start at, at first principles, what is dark matter and how do we know that it exists if we can't see it? So I usually say these. So imagine you enter a dark room mm -hmm. and you stumble upon something. So you know that something must be must be there, mm. but in, you don't you can't see, it, so you don't really know what it is. Yeah. So you have some sort of evidence, which is not like by using your eyes, but yeah. using some other senses, that something is in the room, but you just don't see it. Yeah. And that's kind of what happens with dark matter. So uh, we call it dark uh, not because it's black; it's just because uh, uh, it's mysterious. Uh, yeah. So in dark in that sense. Yeah. And uh, we see evidences that tell us there is something there, which is like, like some kind of mass, right? A massive, like something. Uh, but we don't know really what it is. And so that's why we call it dark matter. Yeah. And r right now we say that 85% uh, um, of the matter in the universe is dark so we actually don't know what it is yeah. although we do know that it's there yeah. and we do know that it's there for several reasons uh one of them is for example uh gravitational lensing so you see a far ob a, an object far away light will should get to you uh, get to you in a straight line but it does not because there is something massive in between you and the the source mm. Uh, which bends the light. Yeah. You yeah. cannot see the thing that is bending the light, but since you see the light that mm. gets bended, then you say, oh, there's something in between me and the source. Yeah. So this is one of the evidences. And then there are also cosmological evidences, etc. Then you can say, right, so we have this dark matter issue. Uh, like, what is dark matter? So, uh, like, uh, I'm not an expert on on the various uh, uh, like uh, dark matter candidates, but yeah. the one that uh, uh, Xenon One Tan was originally designed for is uh, a dark matter particle, uh, which is called a uh, WIMP. Yeah. So there are lots of particles. So uh, I don't know if your audience needs this, but I usually explain like this. Where I was explaining this to my grandma the other day. Yeah. So like everything around us is made of like tiny little bricks. Yeah. So if I chop everything down, I'll get to atoms. And there are devices, uh, kind of like microscopes, that can see these atoms. And then if I break it, like if I split the atom, I can get other bits and bobs. Yeah. And these bits and bobs are electrons and a nucleus. And maybe like the majority of the people have in mind the nucleus and the electrons going around the nucleus. Yeah. So then I try to split the electron again and I can't. Yeah. So then I call it an elementary particle. Yeah. And right now we have a pretty clear picture of what elementary particles are. Uh, among these particles, uh, we don't know if like WIMPs uh, are, among, um, are among these particles. So if uh, dark matter is made of particles, uh, those could be WIMPs. Uh, and in that case, these, could, these would be elementary particles like the electron. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. So in terms of dark matter, we know it's there because of these these indirect measurements like gravitational lensing, like the rotational curves of of galaxies. So we know something must be there, but we're not quite sure what it is. And these these WIMPs, which are weakly interacting massive particles, are an interesting um, candidate potential because they interact weakly, which they must do because otherwise they would they would yeah we would have we would, seen yeah, them we would have seen them already. So they must be weakly interacting. And they must be massive because they have a gra gravitational interaction with with normal matter, even though we can't see them, quote unquote. So weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs, um, make sense. And this is something that that Xenon One Ton is is designed to look for. Um, what energy ranges? What sort of mass ranges is is Xenon One Ton sort of sensitive to? What, how big uh, and how energetic would these these WIMPs likely be? Like so, the mass of the wimps would be around uh, like GV or even further up. Uh, so this is the, the the kind of mass we're we're looking uh, for. And but then, what we actually see is not the particle itself. Uh, hmm. We see. Uh, I usually say this that it's like. Uh, uh, a person walking on a beach uh, and leaving footprints. Yeah. So what we see is the footprints left by yeah. the dark matter particle. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, the footprints are are what? So we so xenon. It's it's called xenon for a very obvious reason that it works with liquid xenon. Yeah. Liquid xenon. Well, xenon is a noble gas, and if you liquefy to my uh, it gets liquid at minus 100 degrees Celsius. And once uh, uh, it's liquid, you can store it in a tank. Uh, mm -hmm. And th that's basically the, the core of uh, Xenon, the Xenon experiment. So, it's so, a so, tank. So, so the experiment is a huge tank of Xenon under a mountain in Italy, basically. Is yes. Yeah. Actually, I mean, not even that huge. I mean, depends on which standards. Yeah. So I, I also work on neutrino experiments. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, the proto-dune experiment at CERN, yeah. which is a prototype of this dune experiment mm. in the US. So, so proto-dune holds 900 tons of liquid <laughs> argon. So it's a huge cryostat. It's oh, like a 10 by like 10 super, by 10. Super Cameo Candy or something, which is... Yeah, well, awesome. smaller than that, but like, yeah, Super Cameo Candy would be huge. Yeah. So Xenon is actually not that huge, also because Xenon is much, much heavier than mm. argon or water. Yeah. So uh, it, it, like it's it's very dense, yeah. uh, well, heavy in that sense, dense. So it's not that huge, the tank, actually, mm. uh, uh, compared to other experiments such as like Super Cameo Candy or Proto Dune, etc. Um, but yes, the, the, the principle is, uh, is, yeah, I mean, it's, the same. So you have this target, uh, which is enclosed uh, in a tank, uh, and that's the core of the detector. Mm. So imagine that WIMPs uh, do exist. Uh, so what happens then? So the WIMP, uh, well, okay, WIMPs do exist. Uh, I didn't say this. And uh, we think that uh, there is, uh, like, we are surrounded by WIMPs, uh, right? So we are in this, like, sea of WIMPs or, like, halo. It's usually called dark matter halo. So the Milky Way would be embedded in this halo and we just go through this halo okay so the earth was through the halo and the solar system uh, does the same right yep. and so you have this wind of particles coming towards you because of this relative motion um, with the galaxy and we believe that the halo is actually pretty static it doesn't move that much but we do and so these particles we would just like traverse our bodies uh, are like the walls uh, and also the uh, xenon tank. So, uh, uh, and another thing, so th this experiment is actually under a mountain. Mm -hmm. So you, before you were mentioning the uh, Laboratori Nazionali del Gran Sasso. Gran Sasso in Italian means big stone. Okay. It's the name of the mountain or big rock. Yeah. Uh, it's the name of the mountain. And underneath the mountain, there is a tunnel uh, like a highway tunnel, and which like uh, I mean, any anyone can go through the tunnel, but not not everyone can enter 
the like secret uh, butt cave uh, where <laughs> the uh, the Zenon experiment and other experiments are hosted. Yeah. So there is this sign. So you go through the tunnel. There is this sign. It says laboratories, and then they open you this uh, like uh, gate. There you enter. Th there are three holes, and in one of these uh, three holes, uh, there is uh, the Zenon experiment. Mm. Right. So why Andre Mountain? Well, because there are other particles uh, that come from the universe uh, and you want to just uh, have a shield. Yeah. And a natural shield is uh, like rocks. A big, rock. a big mountain, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so usually, and we are actually very lucky because usually these experiments are either under mountains or uh, under mines. Yeah. Yeah. But mines are a bit more tricky to work with uh, because like, you have like narrow spaces, uh, very confined. Yeah. So, 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 so uh, something like like Minos is it, it, which is in a, I think it's in a mine in Colorado, is it? Yeah. yeah. Or or like for example, the uh, kind of uh, the Zenon competitor, if you want, uh, <laughs> would be uh, the uh, well previously was called Lux experiment, uh, and now it's been upgraded to uh, the LZ experiment, and that one is in South Dakota, yeah, and it's uh, undermined, yeah. Um, right, so we said that it's under a mountain. We said that the core of the experiment is this uh, uh, tank which contains liquid xenon. And we said, let's suppose that wimps do exist and they are to surround us and we go through this halo of wimps. So then what happens then? Well, then the wimps can, uh, I mean, they, they just inter, they would interact, uh, very few of them, right? It's not that all of them do interact. Yeah. Few of them can interact with the, the liquid xenon. How? Basically, uh, we said that it's a, it's a weak interaction that would happen with the nucleus of the liquid xenon. So then the wimp gets in, interacts with the nucleus of the xenon atom, uh, the, the WIMP leaves the detector, so we don't see it. And we, what, what we do see is the trace left mm. by the WIMP, so mm. the, the, the footprint that I was talking about before. And what are these footprints? Well, it's the, the footprints are actually given by the uh, nuclear recoil, right? So, so the nucleus recoils, and when it recoils, uh, something uh, interesting happens in liquid xenon. Uh, that the recalling nucleus produces light and charge. Mm. The light uh, is seen by these photosensors, which are just very, very sensitive eyes uh, inside the tank. And the charge is drifted upwards by means of an electric field. And um, it the... I, I didn't say at all, the, the tank uh, is filled uh, with liquid xenon, but there is uh, also a tiny gap at the top, uh, which is gaseous mm. xenon. So then these electrons get extracted into the gaseous uh, xenon, where they produce uh, secondary scintillation, so another flash of light. Yeah. So you have a first flash of light, uh, which basically tells you when uh, the, uh, the event happened, and um, also tells you uh, the energy deposited by, by the particle. And then this uh, charge is extracted, another flash of light uh, uh, is produced, it, it gets uh, um, uh, detected by a photosensor, so the photosensor are at the top and at the bottom, they're called the photomultiplier tubes. And that gives you basically the X, Y position of mm. the event. Yeah. So you can really say where the event took place. Yeah. Was it uh, right inside uh, the detector? Was it at the edge? We don't want uh, events at the edge because uh, that can be produced also by uh, what we call uh, background uh, mm. um, events. So by radioactive decays uh, happening uh, uh, because of materials uh, inside uh, the tank. Mm. So then you know, and then you have to check that uh, the energy deposited uh, corresponds to the one of like a wind particle, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but then not only nuclear recoils happen. So we distinguish between nuclear recoils and electron recoils. And the two weeks ago, roughly two weeks ago, 
we uh, published we s published this paper, which was not actually looking into nuclear recoils, but it was looking into electron recoils. Electron recoils are usually the background we do not want. Yeah. But then electron recoils could also be produced by some interesting particles, among which uh, axions. So, yeah. And that's basically the excess we reported on uh, roughly two weeks ago. So maybe if we, if we stop one second and just sort of sum all that up. So the reason that it's a huge tank of xenon under a mountain, so the, the mountain, the shielding stops all other types of particles getting to the detector. Um, well, most of them, apart from the wimps that you want to see and other things and like new, neutrinos, neutrinos or high energy muons can still get through. But we're trying to lower that background as much as we can. We want a large tank of xenon so that we get as many interactions in that tank, even though there's not likely to be many per number of wimps that hit, but we want as many as we can see. Um, and we want a quite low energy threshold so that we so that we see everything. Um, and then in terms of the detection of these particles, that amount of light and charge that gets given off by that interaction helps us to identify the different types of particles that might have might have hit the liquid xenon. So um, yeah, good, excellent. So, so what are the particles that despite your best efforts still get to the detector? What are the other backgrounds and problems that you have to only see in WIMPs? So neutrons, uh, electrons from beta decays and uh, uh, gammas or like x-ray uh, mm -hmm. photons uh, from radioactive decays yeah. so the, the real problem if you want is the material inside which uh, are i mean uh, there is some uh, radioactivity the xenon itself can have some contaminants yeah. which are radioactive for example krypton 85 uh, you have, so you try to have very pure xenon of one yes. isotope so you can understand. Yes. So, for example, you have a distillation mm. system to get rid of the krypton. Yeah. So we don't have it. Uh, but then then the materials, so the stainless steel, yeah. the PTFE, the copper, anything has very little traces of, for example, uranium, uranium and thorium. Yeah. So the most... Uh, uh, if you want like important uh, uh, radioactive uh, um, elements uh, are the ones that have a very long decay time. Yeah. So uranium is like 10 to the nine years. Uh, yeah. So it's not that you can just uh, uh, select something uh, which is pure because it's sitting there for a long time. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not radioactive. No, uranium thorium will always be there. Yeah. Uh, so, for that reason, you need uh, any way to have uh, materials which are very radio pure. And then you need to know to quantify the, the purity, uh, the radio purity of these materials. So there are a number of reasons, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a number of techniques to do that. Uh, for example, one involves uh, using a mass spectrometer. So you, uh, before building the detector, you analyze all the components and you see how much of these and that uh, th those materials have so that you can then have a background model uh, based also on these numbers that you have measured, which basically tells you how many background events you expect. So how, how, do, we, how do we get to that level of expectation? So you said there's things like neutrinos we still expect to go into the detector. We can veto the muons. How do we, how do we build up the, the number of background events that we expect? Is it is it simulated? Is it from theoretical measurements? How, how yeah, do we it, build that up? It's uh, it's uh, simulated. Then some of the numbers do come from actual measurements, uh, mm. uh, such as, for example, as I was saying before, you measure the uh, amount of uranium and thorium yeah. that the PTFE yeah. uh, that you used to build the detector uh, would have. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you plug those numbers into your simulation. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so and then I'll, you I'll, have show, I'll show people the picture, the, 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 the events, traces that you get, the number of background lines. There's, there's so much work that goes into 
understanding and extracting these backgrounds before you even start doing the experiment. Exactly. You really yes. need to understand those backgrounds to be able to know if you've seen something different. Exactly. So it's it's a bit like uh, you know, like a Where's Wally cartoon where there's all, all these things are going on. And if you can remove everything else from that picture, then Wally will be obvious and you can see him. But understanding exactly. everything else that's going on in the background is a uh, is a huge Precise. undertaking and there's so many different sources that can come in. Yeah. So you ran the detector from 2016 to um, 2018. Um, so do you just you just leave it running, I guess, and, and sort of not interact with it for for two years? How does that work? It must be very um, must have to be very stable, like, you know, to power cuts and fluctuations and anything that, that sort of. goes. Yeah, there, like wa there was also an earthquake here in the <laughs> So so. Uh, it's never I've never seen like uh, a detector being like stable meaning that nothing happens yeah. Yeah. there is also always something going on mm. for example even the earthquake which you cannot really predict yeah, of course yeah uh, but then and then um, also there are um, so the there are some runs uh, we call them runs so like when you start a data acquisition in some particular configuration. For example, you want to do a calibration, okay? So you want to know, I see this amount of flashes. I uh, see this amount of uh, charges, uh, like the, the, the second flash uh, up in the uh, gaseous xenon. And I want to know how much energy was deposited. So you need to know, you basically have some sources uh, which you use to calibrate uh, your yeah, yeah. detector. So obviously when th those runs are calibration runs, uh, and then you have runs uh, where you're not doing anything, you just yeah. let the detector go, yeah. and those are background runs. Yeah. We, we call them background runs, uh, but then the hope is that uh, those are kind of WIMP runs yeah, uh, in the yeah, sense yeah. that you're, you're going to see uh, WIMPs uh, when analyzing uh, those data. Yeah. Um, so yes, in general, I mean, ideally you would want to have a very stable detector, very stable conditions of operations uh, uh, throughout the life of your detector. And because, uh, we're, because there's so few of these interactions, I guess the longer you can leave it, the higher the probability of seeing an excess of these events in your, in your exactly, detector. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So the, the exposure time, uh, the more the time, mm. the, the, the more chances you have to see something. So we want as big a detector as we can get and to leave it for as long as we can. Yeah. Cool. And uh, after that, that first sort of, um, or after that physics, that two year physics run, what were the, what were the results that, was, that were observed? Because it's caused a little bit of a, a stir in the, uh, the international community and why we're, we're having this, uh, this discussion. Yeah. So. So, so with regards to WIMPs, uh, we published uh, uh, what we call upper limits. Uh, so basically, it's kind of like uh, a, an exclusion game, right? Yeah. So you say, I, I haven't seen anything about my background, statistically significant about my background. Mm. So I just say, okay, it cannot be there. It must be uh, a particle which uh, interacts uh, less yeah, yeah. and so i uh, right now i don't have the sensitivity to see it above my background yeah. right uh, i don't know if i explain myself uh, uh, well uh, then uh, so, so wimp wise uh, we only published upper limits uh, yeah. which means uh, we haven't seen a wimp yeah. right? so we, we didn't well. discover wimps no we, we, we can put certain certain uh, limitations on the characteristics yes. of WIMPs if they were to exist. Yes, basically it's like, uh, uh, I don't know if the analogy works, but like it's like uh, I, uh, I tell you that there is like a light source uh, in a dark room yeah. and you don't see it. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but it ha I I'm telling you, it is there. So, so you say, well, I don't see it, and why am I not seeing it? Well, I, I, it's not that I'm not seeing because it's not there, but it's so feeble yeah. that my eye cannot see it, yeah. right? But then maybe, I don't know, uh, Peter comes in and yeah. he has better 
eyes than you <laughs> and he can see the, the yeah. feeble light, right? Yeah. So that's basically kind of the what happens with, uh, with, with Xenon. So we build Xenon one ton, maybe it's not sensitive enough to yeah. see this feeble signal and yeah. so we need something more sensitive which would be Xenon n ton. Yeah. But then what uh, we did observe was the following. So we observed the uh, uh, so uh, electron recoil wise. By the way, all, all the all the plots and all the graphs appear magically. So right, okay. If you want to talk about a plot or a or a graph, I'll put them all in. So you can just be like right. Uh, so bit. then I would say yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there is this graph where you are going to see a red line. Yeah. And you're gonna see some uh, uh, black dots. Yeah. So the black dots uh, are uh, data, yeah. uh, and the red line is the uh, is the fit to the background model, right? So you have a background model, you fit to it uh, this this red curve, and that's what you get. Yeah. And you. You, you, so, you... So, so just to clarify for people who are, who are listening, yeah. the, the red line is what we expected to see from, exactly. our, from our background models and theoretical ideas. Exactly. And, and then it fits the data quite well, except in one area of the graph. Exactly. So if we go back to the analogy of the feeble light in the dark room, let's say that you have not managed to close your blinds really, really well. So there is still some light from outside, which is which is getting in, mm. right? And that's your background light. Mm. And on top of that, there is an actual source of light in the room, which I'm telling you, you should find mm. out. Uh, but then uh, you see something and you're like, oh, I'm seeing something and I'm telling you, no, 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 no. It's just because you haven't closed your blinds well yeah. and that's the light you're seeing. So you, so that's kind of the analogy. So the the, the light coming from outside would be the, the red line in the right, plot. Yeah, yeah. And the, the dots, the black dots, would be the light from outside getting inside, but also this light that I'm, this source of light that I'm telling yeah, you, it's, yeah. in, it's within the room which uh, you're looking for. So, so the data, the black dots are everything that was seen by Xenon 1 ton. Exactly. And, and the red line is what we expected to see. And what we exactly. saw was above what we expected to see in the small area of the graph, which I'll put a nice red ring around. Exactly. Around. So then uh, I believe in the paper there are several uh, uh, feats uh, to the uh, these black mm. dots. So I don't remember the colors right now. <laughs> but uh, uh, basically... So by eye, you're like, okay, mm -mm, I think there is some excess there around yeah, the yeah. two, two, three uh, kilo electron volts in the plot. Yeah. So I think I think the result says there were 285 events observed, um, and you expected 232 plus or minus 15. So sort of excess of about 50 events, which would be a three and a half sigma fluctuation. So has a low probability of occurring at what's three, what's three sigma? So three sigma is like so, 0.1%. Yeah, so, so the three point, so the, so the the sigma depends on the model you're applying. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so basically what you do is, uh, okay, I'm seeing these, uh, uh, these extra events and uh, what could that be? So in the paper, we listed uh, some hypotheses. Uh, so it could be tritium. Tritium mm -hmm. is an, yeah. an isotope of hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, then it could be solar axions. It yeah. could be um, uh, the en enhancement of the neutrino uh, magnetic dipole moment. So like, there's three ways to explain this excess that, that yes. you've looked at. Three hypotheses. One would yes. be that there's some sort of contamination background in the detector that you you haven't accounted for so that would be the tritium exactly the when you say accounted for that means that we when we modeled our background we didn't, didn't thought it uh, exactly okay. it was not in okay exactly. so it was considered but it wasn't put in okay i'm, I'm with no, you it was well at the time it was actually not even considered it's, it's okay. when you see the excess and you're like okay maybe <laughs> i there, there was some kind of background yeah, yeah. 
that I didn't take into consideration yep. that could explain the excess. Yep. So, this, so this would be no you, new physics. It would be a, exactly. A so you call these background, like tritium would be a background, but but in terms of like fitting it to it, the excess, that would be your signal, which yeah, is a bit sure. confusing. But, sure, sure, sure. Uh, right? So there's, so, there's, there's one tritium, which would be sort of contamination in the detector, and then there's two others, which would be new physics. So these exactly. solar axions or a potential... Um, misunderstanding enhanced value of the magnetic moment of the of, exactly. the, of the neutrino. So let's let's yes. start with the tritium. So, what is tritium, and where would it be coming from in the detector to to help explain this this excess that we see? Okay, so uh, tritium is an isotope of uh, uh, hydrogen. Mm. Uh, so you still have one proton inside, so it's just in the different number of neutrons inside the uh, nucleus. Um, and, uh, uh, and it could come from, uh, so cosmic activation. Uh, we thought of different ways it could uh, uh, possibly got in at some point. Uh, water or hydrogen but like uh like with tritium content yeah. and basically if uh, uh, you fit this excess uh, uh, within uh, these hypotheses uh, you get a st statistical significance of that excess of 3.2 sigma mm. so usually in particle physics uh, uh, a threshold was set to claim a discovery which is five sigma. Yeah. So if you don't hit that five sigma level, then uh, I mean people take you. I mean, it's a three point a three point five should be taken seriously, yeah. but not seriously as I discovered something. Yeah. Yeah. We saw three point two with the tritium, right? Yeah. Then with the uh, magnetic. So, 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 so no, to explain sorry. that to to people who are watching, the the tritium hypothesis that it might be tritium would then fit the data reasonably it, well. Exactly. So basically, like when we say 3.2, 3.5, 5 sigma, uh, I usually explain in this way. It's like uh, um, uh, it's like this scale you have for hotels, so like uh, one, two, three, uh, four, five stars hotel. So if you have a, a five sigma significance, uh, that's kind of a five star hotel. Yeah. And you say, oh, that's uh, I, 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 I found out uh, something new so uh, that, that's my discovery um why discovery well because the in the background you were not expecting that uh, and you saw it uh, with that confidence uh, yeah. in a way yeah. um 3.5 is uh, uh is so, sorry if, uh, so so 3.2 is still not uh, five but it's um it's I mean, decent. Yes, it's decent. It's a good level of evidence. So, so, it, it, so we could get rid of the excess, quote unquote, and explain it away to good confidence with this tritium hypothesis. So, exactly. The tritium hypothesis is, uh, forgive me for saying it this way, but quite boring because it's not new physics. Exactly. And then the other options that also explain the data would be um, new physics. So let's start with the. Um, with the neutrino magnetic moments. In the standard model of particle physics, the neutrinos are massless. So they don't have this little magnetic dipole. Um, and that means that they interact at a certain rate or we would expect them to interact at a certain rate. However, if we have this un enhanced dipole moment, we would expect them to interact more at certain energy ranges in our detector. And then that would help us to explain why we see this yeah. excess of interactions yes. in our that, in That's our a very good explanation. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, yes. That's so, precisely it. But this, but this would be new physics, right? Because that would be, although the, the neutrino magnetic moment's an input to the standard model, we'd expected it to be very small. And now we're saying yes. it would have to be much larger than we anticipate to be able to um, yes. explain this excess. And I think, exactly. I think those results actually... If you were to explain this excess away using the magnetic moment, it comes into conflict with some other measurements we have of that magnetic moment from Borixino and the cooling yes. of globular clusters and things. So exactly. They wouldn't be too happy about you using this, this explanation. So, so even yes. though it works, 
it would put you in conflict with the measurement of that neutrino magnetic moment well, and other also this solar axion one to be honest uh, so oh, really? uh, yes so there are tensions uh, with uh, um, stellar cooling mechanisms uh, there are a it's there is now a very large number of papers uh, which is coming out every day uh, <laughs> with uh, uh, theoreticians coming up with uh, like new physics uh, yeah. that would reconcile the two things uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in the case of yes we did actually see a solar axion um, but that's for uh, theoreticians <laughs> well, let, well, let, let, let's talk about solar axions then and then we'll talk about that tension so the other the other solution to this would be that we're seeing solar axions interact in in xenon wonton. So can you tell us what, what axions are and where they'd be coming from in this case? So so axions were uh, particle uh, theorized uh, um, something like, I guess, 50 years ago to solve another problem in particle physics. So they could be a viable candidate for dark matter. <clears throat> now, even if we did observe solar axions, that does not tell you that we have observed the dark matter in the form of solar axions. Okay. Why? Because the solar axions that could possibly give the excess are axions produced in the sun. That's why we say solar axion. Mm. Um, and why can we observe uh, those solar axions uh, but not axions in general. So, well, because the solar axions uh, have uh, a, uh, <clears throat> some uh, more kinetic energy, enough kinetic energy to give you uh, a uh, detectable signal inside uh, the Zen one ton uh, mm -hmm. detector. Uh, so, if uh, the excess uh, uh, was, uh, could, could be explained, but was due to solar axions, uh, these axons are coming from the sun. Yeah. So this doesn't tell you yet yeah. that the axons are the explanation to the dark matter problem. So, so axions would have also been produced in the early universe. There'd be, there'd be so many of them to, to out there to explain dark matter. And seeing solar axions wouldn't necessarily tell us that all the dark matter in the universe is... Yes. Stellar axions, because they're yes, there is an extra step. Uh, There's an extra step required. Yes, but it would still exactly. be new physics to say that exactly. we've discovered these axions. Exactly. From the sun. Okay, very, very, very interesting. That that helps to to clear that up. So you talked about the tension between these results. So we said it could be an enhancement to the neutrino magnetic moment, could be solar axions, it could be decays of tritium, the tritium being the sort of boring version. Um, how much in which one, in your opinion, is is most likely? You because you talked about there's a lot of tension between it being these new physics ones with with other results, and then it, it feels like the tritium is the most the most sensible one to to uh, to use. So, so I don't know. I, so because uh, I, I, I want it to be the new physics, right? I think I so, guess you guys do as well, but. We've got to be so, careful with uh, sentiments like that. I mean, we. what I can say is that as far as we know, the uh, analysis uh, was done in the correct way. Yeah. Um, then now, uh, I would say also luckily enough, there are a number of papers uh, uh, coming out uh, uh, regarding our excess. Uh, and there are people uh, offering uh, different explanations. Mm -hmm. uh, and we must take them into account. So far, nothing has changed. So it's still like the 3.24 ID magnetic dipole moment of neutrinos, 3.2 for tritium, and 3.5 for solar axons. So, so, so solar axis, to explain that to in, in layman's terms, the solar axion hypothesis fits the excess the best, but still exactly. still doesn't prove that it was solar axion. Yes, so 3.5 means that there is a 2 over 10,000 chances that the ex excess is not due to solar axions, but it's due to a random fluctuation mm. of your background. Yeah. Um, now, if 
I were to make a bet, yeah. then I would probably make uh, like uh, uh, a bet based on uh, the significance uh, of these uh, three yeah. hy hypotheses. Yeah. So it's I don't I don't think uh, I mean the when so, so, so solar axions is a slightly slight favorite at the moment exactly. based on the statistics. Slight, slightly favored, uh, yeah. uh, but nothing more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would say that at this point, that's all we can say. Yeah. Uh, and what we can hope for is obviously that that excess stays, uh, and it's due to new physics. So yeah. I think that everyone, even people <laughs> who said, "Oh, it must be an air leak," uh, or yeah. "It must be some mismodeling of your background," or yeah. I mean, everyone in the physics community is hoping to see something uh, beyond the standard model of physics, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, then will that be the case that we don't know yet? Yeah. Uh, we are confident uh, to have, that we are going to have an answer with uh, Xenon and Tan. Oh, uh, so, we, so, we, so we should get... We should get some clarification because because I've been bitten by Grand Sasso before with the faster than light neutrinos, you know. So when when can we expect this is a different collaboration? Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> I didn't say any any different. But the um yes. When what what would be the timeline for for getting um clarification and uh, and a and a a firm resolution to this to this excess? What 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 are the next steps we could expect to see in terms of analysis and results? I think conservatively, I would say two years, uh, yeah. conservatively speaking, uh, then maybe it could be less than that, uh, but something like that. Uh, so that what, what would be the improvements that Xenon n -ton brought to the table? So you talked about, obviously, there's there's likely to be more interactions in it because it's a it's a bigger tank of Xenon. Is yes. there lower backgrounds relative to... Yes, the amount of lower background, okay. uh, like this new distillation column uh, okay. to get rid of some... Uh, uh, radio uh, active uh, mm. um, elements uh, uh, improved uh, uh, selection of the materials that go inside uh, improved uh, um, assembly procedures uh, uh, a variety of things yeah and obviously the uh, bigger target mass so it's an upgrade in terms of more wimp interactions if they are are there and also lowering the backgrounds which make those greater number even easier exactly, to see over, exactly, the, over the top of the background. exactly exactly okay. exactly and, and then we could ex but we're gonna have to uh we're gonna have to wait two years yes. to, to get a resolution two or less let's see <laughs> we'll do an upper we'll do another upper limit of two years yes <laughs> good so uh i guess we'll have to uh we'll have to wait and see and uh hope we get to see some new physics um dr Menenti, thank you very much for for going going through that with us it's uh I've learned a lot. It's a it's a very interesting signal, um, very interesting finding, and as I say, hopefully we'll we'll get to see some new physics in a in a couple of years. Yeah, but thank you for having me. Great pleasure. Um, where should people keep up with you? Keep up with the Xenon collaboration. Keep keep up with uh, with what's going on. Uh, where you said? Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, a Twitter account. Yeah. Uh, which is called at, at Xenon Experiment. We also have a Facebook page, an Instagram page, which was uh, they were both added very recently. Super. Uh, we also have a website, which is uh, um, we will we'll shortly release a new website as well, like an, a fresher one. Uh, but yes, these are kind of the um, official uh, communication channels, and and then obviously the archive. Uh, and any other scientific journal. Yeah. How, how about yourself personally? Anywhere you would like to people to go, or have you had enough uh, of people like me giving you calls and asking what's going on? No, no. So I also have a Twitter account, which is called Lallina Maninti. I'll put all the, the time, links on the the, Yes, at the time there was no Laura Maninti available. Then it became available, but then I, I, I decided to stick <laughs> You'd with the committed, Lina Maninti. Yeah. Yes, because I thought it it might be less intimidating uh, to 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 be called Lallina instead of Laura <laughs> uh, as a scientist. And uh, I also have a YouTube channel, uh, which is also called Lallina Manenti. I don't have that many videos. <laughs> all right, so all right, we'll get we'll get people there, and hopefully we can uh, 
get you some more subscribers and more watches because they're they're really good um, little videos with sketches of everything that's going on and they and they really hold your hand through particularly stuff that's going on at Zen on One Ton. So they're really really uh, really interesting and really well put together. So everyone go have a look at the, <laughs> the links you. that are down in the description. Um, Dr. Menenti, again, thank you so much for going through that with us again. And uh, hopefully we can chat again soon. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks very much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye now.